So I'm a cruciverbalist. And uh, as a cruciverbalist, that means that I'm an insufferable word nerd. And it also means that when I was working on my desktop New York Times uh, a few weeks ago, I came across a clue that immediately, again, as a cruciverbalist, jumped out at me. So 39 down, forms in an instant and lasts a lifetime. Okay, that's memory. Except I'm also a learning scientist who was originally trained in the molecular and cellular bases of learning and memory. So I know that this is horribly, egregiously wrong. <laughs> learning and memory is actually something, as many of us know, that's challenging. So first off, we've got to set the scene. Learning and memory are actually not really distinct. They're two parts of the same process. You learn something with the sole purpose of holding on to it and having it be portable. So thus, that's the memory element. And we know that, yes, there are some memories, like our own names, that in fact do last a lifetime. But most of our memories actually don't form in an instant. If they did, then cramming would work, <laughs> and we would all, you know, we would all be more than just fluent in one, two, or a few languages. So what is it about memory that we can use to transform how we use it? Because it's something that we all use, need, and perform, yet very few of us understand how it works, let alone how to make it better. So in our discussion of memory, we have to turn to a part of our own brain that's nestled within what we call the medial temporal lobe, and that part is the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is responsible in all vertebrates, whether you're a crow or a crocodile or a cocker spaniel, for remembering things that are critical to survival. So things that are critical to survival of not just you, but also the species. So it's really important to remember where things like your next meal, former meals, and your next and former mate may have been. Because that is what is going to help you survive and the species. And it turns out that the hippocampus is responsible for storing that information. Now, that's really important. We can think about, yes, of course, we need to know how to get from point A to point B, as does a crow or a crocodile or a cocker spaniel. But we as humans also have to know other information as well. So when we think about what happens within the hippocampus, which Again, I mentioned I'm an insufferable word nerd. That actually comes from the Greek, meaning seahorse, because of the way that it's shaped. We have to consider the fact that what's going on within the hippocampus is actually an act of connectivity, forming new connections. So how would we study that? Well, one way to study it is to actually take an organism, like a rat, where we can control what it learns and what it may not already have learned. So the way the neuroscientists and learning scientists do this is using something called the Morris water maze. A Morris water maze, uh, which was developed by the Scottish neuroscientist uh, Richard Morris, is approximately a six foot in diameter tank of water. And you make that water somewhat opaque so that you can't see the platform that you've hidden just beneath the surface. So you've hidden that platform just beneath the surface so that one, like an animal, like a rat that you've placed in the water, doesn't just swim right to it as you would appear if you're swimming at the beach. Instead, what you need the animal to do is to swim around, and it turns out rats are phenomenal natural swimmers, right? Think about sewers and things like that, is you, have, you want the animal to use all of the cues around the room to learn where the platform is. This is no different than if you've ever ventured to a mall at Christmas time and you need to remember where you parked your car. Well, it's sort of 
directly in front of Macy's and Caddy Corner from L.L. Bean. So you do this, and the first day you put the rats into the tank, you'll find that it takes them about 45 seconds to find the platform. It's oftentimes just due to chance. They'll, bring them, they'll pull themselves up onto the platform, take a breather. Now, if you do this several times a day for several days, what you find is by the last day, they'll actually make a beeline, or rat line as the case may be, directly to the platform in less than 10 seconds flat. Thus, you can actually see learning being demonstrated. Now, this is important to study in something like a rat because it gives us the opportunity to see what has happened within said rat's brain. So what we have here is a drawing of what the interior of the hippocampus looks like. If you may notice that it looks as though there are two interlocking C's, makes kind of a spiral. Again, remember hippocampus, seahorse, has to do not with the horsey part at the top, but the fact if you've ever seen a seahorse, its tail curls onto itself. So within the hippocampus, what I and others have found through training animals to find platforms and other things that they didn't previously know is that new connections are made. So what this means is that when an animal actually goes and learns something like a platform, it is actually forming a physical representation through new connections. Now this is really important because this in essence was one of the first times that we were able to see what Carl Lashley back in the 30s called the engram or the memory trace, right? Where is that elusive information that we know we have, but we're not quite sure where or how? So you may be asking, okay, well, yeah, you taught a rat where a platform is, and I thought this was about how we use learning and memory, and there's a crossword in there somewhere. <laughs> so what does this have to do with people? Well, it turns out that actually the study I just told you about took place as a follow-up to try to validate that one could actually induce that connectivity or increase in connectivity because Elizabeth McGuire and her associates had actually done a series of studies um, in the early 2000s that showed that the hippocampi, so the plural of hippocampus, of London cab drivers was actually larger than that of comparable individuals who'd been driving the same amount of time. Now what you may not know is that actually to be able to uh, not to be able to, but to be licensed to drive a cab in the city of London, you have to pass a rather grueling exam. And that exam tests you on the geographic layout of all of the streets and avenues within the city of London, which unlike New York or Chicago, is not and was not a planned city. So you have roads and avenues that sprung up from the time of the Romans all the way to right now where we have skyscrapers. And you never know when there might be construction or other things. So what's interesting about this within cab drivers is it was found that the size of the hippocampus was actually linearly correlated to how long the individual had been driving a cab. So those who had been driving longer had accumulated more expertise and knowledge actually had slightly larger hippocampi. So that was really interesting. Something else that we know about this is subsequent to works on connectivity that have looked at MRIs and, and really delved within the brain is the fact that this causal nature is such that it's not just about that spatial information. Because I started by talking about crows and Congress manuals and crocodiles and the hippocampus and spatial learning and then we talked about rats and water for some reason, and then London cab drivers, but it's all linked together. Because it turns out that although I was talking about spatial learning, we as humans need to accumulate all kinds of other types of knowledge and information throughout our lives. For example, it's useful to know that one pound is equivalent to 16 ounces. It behooves one, word nerd, to know that 
The amount of squishiness of an avocado will tell you whether or not it's perfectly ripe or too far gone for guacamole. And it's also useful, going back to our cab drivers, to know when one can turn right. Is it on a red? Is it not? And when one cannot. So it's not just about spatial learning. It turns out that all types of what, are, what is called declarative learning relies upon the hippocampus for entry into our long-term memory. So this means that those facts and figures that I just mentioned about avocados and weight, actually, you know that I was right when I said that because that information came through your hippocampi as well. And we know this for a fact, not because of rats swimming in a pool or because of London cab drivers, but because of unfortunate cases. For example, the debilitating disorder Alzheimer's disease affects the hippocampus, and the first thing that is impacted is short-term memory, or the ability to bring in new information. We also know from decades of work spent studying an unfortunate patient uh, who went by the two letters HM, who had both of his hippocampi almost completely removed. Now, they were removed to treat him uh, using what at the time was a revolutionary procedure for epilepsy that could not otherwise be treated. The good news is, yes, the epilepsy was cured, and I'm not being flip. It was, and it was quite debilitating. But the bad news is this individual was unable to form new memories for the remainder of his life, which lasted decades. If anyone has seen the uh, powerful and, and, and actually gripping thriller Memento by Christopher Nolan, which came out around 2001, this is one of the few movies that actually does a fantastic job of depicting what the hippocampus does and what happens when it's damaged. So the hippocampus in humans is responsible for not just spatial information, but important complicated information in learning. Things like how to make a souffle or how to make a loved one happy. So what do we do with that? How is it that something in other animals all other vertebrates is used merely for survival that we use for things that might be considered irrelevant. For example, you may know the name of Britney Spears' first husband or incredibly useful, like your own children's birthdays, middle names, and so forth. Well, to answer this question, we have to actually rewind the clock a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean tens of thousands of years in our own existence as a species. And we have to go to the grasslands of Africa. It is here where when we started developing and using tools that we actually started to need to know more things than just where's danger, where's food, and where's a mate. We actually started to accumulate knowledge in different ways like the fact that if you use this particular rock or this tool, maybe you can have something that you couldn't previously have, or how to make a fire, things like this. And so what we, and to be completely honest, are now extinct cousins, the Denosovans to the east and the Neanderthals to the north, all did is to start to co-opt the hippocampus without meaning to, without realizing it, we phylogenetically started to use a part of our brain meant for one thing for something completely different. So what that means is that we as humans now, in this time and age, are beneficiaries of this amazing device, this instrument between our ears, the human brain, that does so much more than it was originally evolved to do, and yet most of us don't harness the full potential. Now, I am not up here espousing what is called a neuromyth, because it's a myth about the brain, which is one you may have heard, which is that humans only use 10% of their brain. No, I am not saying that. And I'm not saying it for two reasons. 
Reason number one, evolution is incredibly frugal. It does not develop something so that 90% of it can just go unused. Number two, if you are only using 10% of your brain, I apologize, you are in a vegetative state. <laughs> so it is not about that, but rather a way to take our evolutionary history and to align that, connect it with things that we now need. This methodology, one of thinking about new information vis-a-vis -vis geography, is something that actually is not new. I'm not coming to you with some idea that's brand spanking new. I wish I were, but unfortunately, uh, Simonides of Seos, in about 500 years before the birth of Christ, came up with something called the method of loci. The method of loci essentially says, or doesn't say anything, but what, how one would use it is to actually take information to be learned and place it in your imagination along a route that you know really well. So you can think of this along the lines of what's often been called a memory palace, right? So in this memory palace, and that's very regal, and all of a sudden in my head I have a song from Frozen going on. But, but in that memory palace, one, the reason why it's a palace is because it has many rooms. But you actually don't need that. You don't need many rooms because you actually have, within your own mind, all of the rooms you've been in. Think about your childhood home. You can still navigate it. Think about the classroom where you live. 2 plus 3 equals 5. Although you don't remember the exact event, I find it hard to believe that you would say, here's the exact day, you still remember the classroom. And probably different elements of it, like maybe your name up or A, B, C, D along the top. So how would we use this? Well, one way we could use the method of loci in our common, in, in our everyday life would be not to worry about a palace, just start with your kitchen. If you right now, if I were to ask you to picture your kitchen and your drawers, I bet you could tell me exactly what is in each of your drawers. You could tell me in the silverware drawer if the knives are kept to the left or the right of the spoons. In your drawer where you keep assorted cooking implements, you could tell me whether or not you have a meat mallet in there or you have a strawberry hauler, or anything else. And you may even be able to tell me if it's normally shifted to the left or the right. And if you're one of those people who has a junk drawer, it's good to have a junk drawer, you can tell me which keys are in there to locks you no longer remember, the rubber bands, and possibly a receipt from a purchase you made three years ago. So if we take all of that information, which we know and we can't seem to forget, we could actually start to arrange new things we want to learn in those drawers. You can visualize putting it in there. You can even use things like, okay, well, here's where I keep everything I bake with. So if you're trying to learn something foundational, maybe if you keep the flour in one cabinet and the sugar in another, you could think of the sugar as adding to the flour. And so that relationship you can carry over to new things that you're learning as well. This particular method has actually been shown through rigorous studies to actually facilitate the learning of thousands of anatomical structures by medical students in their gross anatomy courses. In addition, if you're worried about the fact that, well, maybe my imagination isn't very good, Turns out that virtual reality can take that role. So by actually going through virtual or what we would call first person environments in a computer uh, simulation, you could still actually get the same benefit as one would by just dipping back into their own imagination and their past. So what this means is just like we took a journey of transformation here today of the hippocampus from thinking about only storing spatial memory in our cousins 
to now storing all information, we can see how powerful it can be if we then down the road encounter something like a crossword puzzle. We'll be able to answer those questions and just perhaps if there is a clue that comes up, nine letter word, blank helps learning and memory, you'll know that the answer is map making. <laughs>